Okay, folks, we're live. You're listening to the Wizard Radio, WZRD Chicago, 88.3 FM, WZRDChicago.org for streaming around the world and beyond. And we have a very special interview today. We're going to be talking about some stuff that uh, needs to be talked about. We have on the line right now Anil Prasad, and you know him from interviews, uh, one of the earliest, if not the very first, I believe, uh, online music magazine. And I remember back in when you started in 94, 95, 96, before I had a computer, uh, when there were a lot of cyber cafes, Googling, or actually it wasn't Google yet, uh, but searching, did anybody ever talk to Ralph Towner? Did anybody ever talk to any members of YES? Did anybody any, ever talk to David Torn? And this is the gentleman. Anil, welcome to WZRD. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's dig right in, man. Um, let's let's start with talking about talking. <laughs> what makes a good interview? What makes a horrible interview? How has interviewing changed over the years from your perspective and music j- journalism in general? Wow, that's a very big question, a really good question. Um, you know, I look back to you know, certain eras of music journals, and there was a, a wonderful magazine called Musician, which you probably know very well. Yeah. Um, that was a really big deal in the 80s. You know, there were publications like Guitar Player Magazine, which would uh, essentially be an encyclopedia, you know, of, of the instrument and its players, and it would run two, three, four thousand word wonderful pieces of great depth and not just about gear, um, you know, and, and promoting, uh, you know, advertisers. Um, it was really heavily philosophical. Um, I should say I did have the, uh, the ter- terrific opportunity of working for them, sorry, uh, during, you know, the latter days of, uh, you know, the, the, the great era of in-depth journalism. You know, I think as the web um, started to take over, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the early 90s when you could pretty much do anything, the web was very much free form. Uh, people were running pieces as long as they needed to be, and that was kind of what uh, uh, you know the start of interviews was. Um, I had been working, you know, in print journalism, and uh, had realized the early potential of the web um, to run, you know, much longer versions of these pieces that had very strict word counts, you know, six hundred to eight hundred to twelve hundred words, and suddenly I could run six or 7,000 words. Now, you know, as the internet got monetized over the decades, you know, as advertising came in as, uh, you know, so-called pay-per-click or search engine marketing and all these sort of concepts came in, um, you know, music journalism very much became clickbait. It became about getting people to click on headlines Um so they would be exposed to the advertising on that page um, with the piece. And not only that, you know, the pieces would either be very short or you would get four or 500 words um, per page and you would have to click over to the next page so you would get the next set of ads. Um, And basically we we hit a stage where people got very, very sensational, very, very soundbite-ish. And uh, sort of the potential, you know, for great in-depth journalism on the Internet started to, you know, evaporate very significantly. And I'm not saying there aren't exceptions. There are some other wonderful uh, places uh, to go, you know, all about jazz. And uh, a lovely writer named John Kelman, Sid Smith, publishes some great stuff online. Um, you know, there are people still doing the real stuff, but uh, by and large it's become you know, they, they use the term news aggregators now, you know, for the sort of farming of content uh, that, that's delivered, you know, in this very, fairly meaningless, uh, you know, inane way these days. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. You know, and, and, the, and the, the, era, the era of the great musician magazines, um, you know, is long gone. Well, I, I certainly know what you mean. Uh, we've talked to John a couple times here. He's become a friend of the wizard here. And... Um, Actually, you um, were the first inspiration, honest to goodness, um, for me to really think about interviewing. I've always um, enjoyed DJing, and uh, the the dramaturgy, 
uh, of, of putting together a set of music is more than just playing tunes you like. And the uh, interview aspect I never thought about until I started reading interviews and then John Kelman's work. And believe it or not, uh, a more recent interview influence for me has been Mark Marin. <laughs> I don't know if you know who he is, but um, he does some interesting interviews, i got to say. Um, do you know who he is by any chance? I'm not familiar with him, no. Okay, he's, it has nothing to do with music. He's a comedian that started a podcast, and he used to do just comedians, but he has a very self-deprecating um, manner, and I think that helps bring out some interesting stuff. Now, he has had some interesting interviews with some interesting musicians, uh, Sean Lennon, Nick Cave, stuff like that. Um, but anyway... You know, you bring up an interesting question when you spoke about what you just spoke about. Have you noticed, Anil, uh, any change, subtle or not so subtle, in the musicians you talk to in the age of Internet? Are they more guarded, less guarded? Are they more worried about sound bites, or, or you haven't noticed any difference at all? Well, I think interviews has established itself as a place you go, uh, or one of the places you go where you can say what you want and know that your thoughts will be reflected accurately, ethically, professionally. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't mean just with you. Agree. I didn't mean just with you, but I mean, have you noticed oh. a change, um, including with you, but have you noticed a change? Are, are, in, are musicians more guarded or less guarded? Um. It's tough to say. Um, I, I know I have a lot of friends who are musicians, um, and I know that they tend to be much more suspicious these days of people converting what they say into meaningless sound bites or uh, sensational sound bites. Um, so in that way, they can be guarded. I think it depends on the people you're talking to. Um, I mean, if Rolling Stone, I think, has turned into one of those uh, very sound bitey, sensationalist t sort of uh, outlets, whereas they used to be, you know, one of the places for in-depth content. Uh, I realize they're doing some in-depth content these days too, but uh, you know, there's all kinds of um, blogs out there. People are so desperate for attention. There's such a glut of music that's released these days that publicists direct musicians to talk to basically anyone. Uh, willing to talk to them. Um, you know, this kind of goes back to, you, you know, I, I didn't answer one of your uh, first uh, questions where you said, you know, what makes a good interview? And what makes a good interview is research and empathy um, and a real understanding of a person's career and, uh, you know, their history. Um, I think a lot of musicians know that when they're talking to some blogs or when they're talking to even some top-tier media that they're not going to get that. They're going to get someone that is looking for a quick headline, something they can package up, get online in the next, you know, 6 to 24 hours, you know, and generate ad clicks. Um, so this is kind of a long-winded way of saying, yes, I think people are getting a little more guarded, a little more suspicious. Um, there's also the other side of that, of, of musicians that just go for it and, and want the sensationalist headlines. Those t don't tend to be the musicians I talk to. I don't sort of talk to yeah. <laughs> the, the Kanye West or the Charlie uh, XCXs of the world. That's not me. So um, the musicians I tend to talk to tend to be clothed and uh, tend to be <laughs> people a little more maybe reserved about uh, you know their aspirations in terms of what they uh, want out there. Well, um, have you noticed... Okay, this is kind of a two-fold question. Most of your interviews, for interviews um, specifically, they are conducted on the phone, in person, by email, all of those? All of them, absolutely. Um, I love the in-person ones. That's obviously not always possible, but I would say 95% uh, in person or by phone, and then there's the outlier 5% by email, which doesn't thrill me <laughs> when the, when it's that situation. Sometimes there's language issues. Uh, I once talked to um, uh, a wonderful Japanese uh, jazz legend named Kazumi Watanabe, and it, of course, it yeah. had to be yeah. by email. Yeah, it had to be by email. Um, um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of translation. Sometimes there are language barriers um, where, where that comes into place. There's even hybrids. There's like this Anya Garbarek 
interview that uh, just ran yesterday. She's the daughter of Jan Gabarek, the, of course, incredibly famous, revered ECM uh, artist. And uh, English is not her first language, so we did an interview uh, on the phone. And then we followed it up with myriad edits, believe it or not, over two years, two whole years um, of uh, refining it, uh, you know, virtually over email. So it, it can happen in a lot of different ways. I mean, at the end of the day, you, it's about sort of getting to the artist's truth and comfort zone about what they want to say and what they, you know, want uh, the world to know about them. Um, yeah, I would like to emphasize that you know, artists on interviews, you know, it's, I'm really trying to really be ethical about what I do, not be a gotcha journalism kind of guy. If I sense that an artist has said something that's going to hurt them, I'll be honest with you, I tell them. <laughs> and I say, maybe we want to approach this differently. Um, I will admit, you know, that might even be almost anti-journalistic. Um, but I'm not out to hurt anybody. No, I consider it, no. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I consider it uh, being considerate because, first of all, a, I'm not just blowing smoke here, but I think it's a testament to your writing style that I can't really tell how you conducted the interviews. So if some of them were email, it doesn't look like that. Um, but I think a lot. I think you tend to bring out stuff in in artists because, uh, and they they're probably a little unguard, more less guarded with you. Because they know that you know their subject, they know that you care, and when you're more open and relaxing and getting into conversation, sometimes you can say a few things that when you look back you go, oh dear, I kind of wish I wouldn't have said it that way. So no, I don't think your approach is anti-journalistic. I think you're actually giving a, a darn what, you know, what people think. And uh, you know that's also, I find, very rare in this gotcha journalism type of situation we, we've gotten into. Now, the Anya Garbarek L, um, interview, I just read that yesterday with my girlfriend. Um, poor thing, she's, uh, she reads much faster than I do, so she's got to wait for a little while while I, while, while I catch up. But that, that interview was really wonderful, and I'm so glad you went in depth um, with her whole career. I discovered her reading about her father on Wikipedia and said, oh, wow, he's got a daughter, and wrongfully assumed that she probably did similar music to her dad or she was first violin in the Norwegian Symphony Orchestra or something. Um, I don't know why, but I went to YouTube first and saw that concert that's up there from 2007, the Outdoor Festival concert. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or not. Um, yeah, I have. It's, it's amazing, yeah. Have you ever seen her? Have you ever gone over and seen any of her performances? I have not. I was actually just in Oslo, where she's based, uh, and I missed uh, the performances of her current work. The road is just a surface by mere weeks. Uh. Um, she is a phenomenal artist, uh, completely um, different from her father. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really easy and lazy to call her a singer-songwriter, but she really is more of a music conceptualist, and her last uh, two albums are utterly uncategorizable <laughs> um if you haven't heard the road is just a surface i would highly recommend it it's, uh, oh yeah oh yeah i bought push, push. i bought the full version and i i i play her a lot on here i'm i'm trying to turn people onto her music because she suffers uh from something that is becoming increasingly threatening to americans and that is smarts and talent um I, I, I'd like, I'm going to throw out an opinion here, and feel free to negate it or chime in. I was just talking about this with my girlfriend yesterday, right after we read your interview with Anya. I, I was born in 59, so I came up in the 60s and 70s, and it seems in retrospect, one measure of a healthy society is when the general populace can celebrate something that's better than them smarter than them, prettier than them, funnier than them, more talented than them. People could go to a concert and not be threatened by the way John McLaughlin played guitar. I can't play like that, therefore neither should he. Now, I don't blame punk music, but the ethos that surrounded punk music, especially in journalism, as dumbing down 
to a sort of populist level of everything, including culture. And I think that Anya suffers from something similar to uh, some of the other artists she's compared to, uh, David Sylvian, Bjork, etc. I, I think people are very intimidated by intelligence, especially in this country. Speak to that. Uh, tell me if you think I'm nuts or you agree or, or what. Uh, I would say that the uh, election of our current uh, president speaks very much to our collective perspective on intelligence and what we as a society are looking for. And I realize that we are talking about about exactly 50% of this country, and there's another 50% that thinks differently, of course. Um, but uh, Well, he got elected of, uh, because this has been going on for so long. He, he's a direct result of the dumbing down of America, uh, in my opinion. They don't know the subtle difference. I, I have a lot of pot-smoking, Grateful Dead fan, uh, friends who voted for this guy. They believe in love and peace. They believe in the power of sound. And they voted for this guy. Uh, uh, and I can kind of understand the initial attraction to him. He didn't speak uh, politicianese. <laughs> he, he pointed to some things in government that needed to be addressed, but immediately began acting like a buffoon. And uh, I think this is a direct result. People have no subtlety for nuance anymore. They don't understand the difference between kicking down the door and trying to replace the door. Um, I think all of that is very accurate. Uh, I think when it comes to the music uh, side of the house, too, I, and I don't think it's just America, frankly. I think uh, if you no, look at that's not. Sort, of, sort of who's, uh, you know, riding the heights of the, the, the pop charts all over the world, it's, it's all pretty dumb these days, and it's all very much streaming-driven. Um, the fact that you know, the streaming uh, medium, the Spotify's and Apple Music's and titles of the world have changed the, the fundamental constructs of pop music. You know, the idea that if a, a listener isn't hooked or engaged within the one to five seconds of that track starting, they're going to click to something else, um, has actually altered, you know, the, the conceptual trajectory of even the most standard formulated pop song. And so we have, you know, generations, you know, now being brought up, you know, on music that uh, has been constructed to that, you know, specification. Now, like an Anya Gabarak or a Bjork or a David Sylvian, who I hope reemerges, um, and rumors are that he might actually, um, you know, they don't cool. care about those rules. They they have they have nothing to do with them, and and you know that's certainly where. Uh, I sit, that's certainly where you sit. Um, all, all you and I can do is, is put the word out there about these musicians, help promote them, and, and hope we can break through, you know, to the small percentage of people that still want to find really interesting stuff. Well, you brought up streaming. Let's, let's lead up to streaming. Um, the decline of music appreciation... Um, uh, yes, it's been taken out of schools, and I think that has something to do with uh, people growing up and, and having the power of sound. Obviously, it's a different world. We had less to do in the 60s. You either listened to the radio or put on a record or went to the movies or went outside to play. That was basically it. And this is why my soul is impoverished these days, because I, I just don't think music will ever be as important to people as it once was, because... There's just more to do as a child. And if you make that connection with people when they're young, it's lifelong. But aside from the changes in the world and the options of what to do with your time as a youngster, um, leading up to streaming and what's become the reality of being a musician these days, can we go back to talk about the pricing of CDs and so forth? Um, I remember reading right around the time Bush Jr. got elected after 9 -1 -1, I was reading the paper a lot more at that time, and I remember it being on the front page that there were class action lawsuits about price gouging with CDs. And the average price at that time, I believe, was 15 or 16.98. Then, after all this hoopla in the newspaper, they had the audacity to raise the list price. Uh, this might have even been before that, because I seem to remember Page and Plant coming out with uh, walking into Clarksdale and asking for 18.99. And... Um, 
Can we speak a little bit about the slow decay of uh, of the music industry, maybe going all the way back to uh, when the CD was introduced, the pricing, and what led to today's streaming world, and, you know, what happened? I thought you were trying to sell your product. <laughs> well, I mean, the CD, certainly CDs were, um, CD pricing was a very fixed structure, you know, and the you know, from the people that made the CD players to the record labels, uh, to the retailers, you know, they would sort of wrap it all up around, you know, investments and infrastructure to create the CDs that uh, didn't exist previously. And the the shift in retail, the shift uh, having to take out all the vinyl racks and put in the CD racks and, um, you know, promoting a new medium to people who weren't aware that, uh, you know, it had, uh, you know, a different attraction than, than the vinyl cassette or eight track worlds. Um, that's how they justified, you know, the, the very high list prices. But let's also remember, I mean, that the late 80s into the 90s were a golden age for the music industry. Um, astounding amounts of money were being made by the business during that era. Um the Tower Records documentary um, is, is really a, a really great insight into the, the rise and fall of the compact disc. Oh, yeah, that's uh, a I great highly, documentary. Highly recommend it. Yeah, I worked for them. Yeah, in, I mean, really. I'm sorry, go ahead, man. Go ahead. No, you please, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying I worked for them. Who cares? Um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, Tower was, what a, I love that place, you know. Prices were high sometimes, but I, I spent, untold hours of my life in tower record stores uh oh the selection the mean, selection to have a whole room of jazz a whole room of soundtracks a whole room of classical and walk into that room and somebody knew what the hell they were talking about yeah um so i mean the cd was a cash cow you know right into the late 90s and obviously things started changing dramatically in the early 2000s and i don't think there's actually a connection between music industry gougery in terms of the, the MSRP of the CD um, as opposed to just the fact that suddenly CD burners became available. That was one of the first downfalls. And then obviously the uh, introduction of the 128K MP3 file uh, compression uh, uh, that obviously has been chronicled in astonishing detail by many, many people. Um, and, you know, the availability of ever-increasing Internet speeds. And, you know, a society um, suddenly realizing that a lot of things that they once paid for could be free. I don't think it would have mattered if that CD was $15 or $2. Okay. Free is still free. Okay. You know, um, uh, and we've proven that to this day. I mean, I have friends that have tried to release albums very cheaply um, for two to five dollars, and they still see their stuff up on torrent sites. <laughs> um, so, and they're like, "You're not willing to even pay two dollars for this album. You still want it for free." Uh, you know, and I, I don't think this holds true just for music. Uh, I think it holds true for a lot of things, and we could go into. You know, I know you follow me on social media and you've sort of seen some of my rants and you abstracted, you know, part of our conversation into the political earlier on. Um, you know, we see a level of unsustainability across multiple realms of society at this point, you know, in human history. Um, the word sustainability comes up in a lot of contexts, not just music, but uh, agriculture, the environment, um, and we seem to be dropping the ball on all of these fronts. And I think uh, people's approach to music is emblematic of their approaches to a lot of other things as well. Interesting. I, I would have to agree with that. Um, so streaming, it comes along. Um, you know, on one in one sense, I think it's amazing because... You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, music is very important to me, maybe abnormally important, mm -hmm. and I sense that it's true with folks like your good self. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's as important as uh, shelter and food, but it 
sort of is to some of us. And that doesn't justify that it should be uh, government subsidized or free or anything like that. But when you are really addicted to music, and especially when you take on the responsibility of uh, doing a radio show or starting an online interviews thing, um, I myself start to feel the responsibility even more so than in my normal life. Wow, i got to be more aware of what's out there. And I just don't have the money uh, to experiment. And I, I want to hear all the new ECM releases. I don't have the money to buy them all. There is that aspect of streaming, um, which I think is healthy. It is spreading the music. It, that, that could even be extended to YouTube to a certain degree. Um, there's a lot of people who would never go see Magma unless they heard them or saw them on, you know, YouTube. However, the, the rate that musicians are getting paid and the fact that the model has completely reversed. It used to be you came out with an album and you did shows and tours to support and promote the album, and that's where you made your money. Now, you have to tour your butt off to make money, and all the venues are taking a piece of your merchandise. I don't know how that started. <laughs> but um, wh what, what are the, the cons of streaming, and are there any pros at all in your mind? So, um, I'm fairly well known out there as an ardent critic of the streaming services. And that gets um, distended um, and inaccurately reported by people who are critics of what I say as Anil is anti-streaming. And I am not anti-streaming. That's I'm why you're streaming. on here today, man. That's why you're on here today, to, to speak the truth of what you feel and not have it be uh, chopped up and disseminated differently. So my perspective is that streaming is absolutely just fine. And it is the here and now, and it is the way the vast majority of people consume music. No problem. Um, one can talk about the overall sound quality of streaming. Um, people rarely uh, invoke the word buffering and understand what that means in terms of the actual overall sound quality and how your brain processes it. But that's kind of not, not just like a three-hour conversation in and of itself. But there are sound quality issues even with high-res streaming, that I would advise people to look into if they're curious. Um, but at the end of the day, the problem with streaming as it relates to musician compensation is that they are simply getting paid next to nothing. Um, and yet, you know, the Spotify receptionist will make $175,000 a year and get stock options and health benefits. So, um, <laughs> wow! Clearly, I didn't you know, know that. The uh, Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify, is a billionaire. Um, lots of people are making a lot of money from streaming, and that is everybody except the musicians and the independent labels. And now we also have to remember that the streaming company, Spotify in particular, is co-owned. Um, by some of the major labels. It's a fascinating, almost Ponzi scheme kind of setup. Um, and I'll, I'll, allow me to kind of drone on for a minute or two here um, and tell you something most people don't want to hear or find too complex or too boring. But, um, I mean, the way these companies make money is fascinating. Um, if, you, if you look at, you know, BMG, one of the investors yeah. um, in Spotify, um, you know, they're making money uh, by having their music on Spotify. Um, then they're making money as an investor in Spotify. Um, so when Spotify stock goes up, you know, BMG makes money as well. And then when Spotify stock goes up, BMG gets to report that on their quarterly earnings calls, uh, you know, impressing their own investors, and then their own stock goes so there's it's like this three level, uh, you know, three layer cake of income for them, um, you know, generating vast quantities of money, none of which are getting translated to musicians. And um, I believe the rate of streaming compensation should be, you know, 10x what it is to make it even remotely worthwhile for musicians to participate in. But what's happened is. Um, you know, while all this wonderful money is being made for these 
corporate interests, you know, again, you know, billionaires are benefiting so dramatically from all of this and the musicians are getting nothing. They're taking kind of a psychological public relations uh, tact with musicians. You see it right now, Spotify for artists and Spotify 2019 rap, these internet posts that musicians get to showcase, you know, the thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of streams and geographies that they're now reaching. What the Spotify wrapped internet posts don't show is the, is the fact that these musicians are earning next to no money. And there's no government oversight that's forcing any of these companies to pay at any you know, particular level. Um, well, uh, you know, it's inter- say, let me just interrupt you real quick. Do you know about this? Um, I don't like the current administration at all. But I do remember reading that he did sign something. Didn't he have Kid Rock and Kanye West in, in the Oval Office? And he, didn't he address this a little bit? Do you know anything about that? And again, I, I don't like this guy, but I, I think he did something, didn't he? Yeah, there was a, you know, a, a, a sort of artist rights sort of um, you know, fair pay, fair play uh, legislation element that came forward, which did absolutely nothing of any meeting okay. to, to change the dynamics. What, what I wanted to just finish, and I'll, I promise I'll stop droning after this. No, you're not, please. I didn't mean to interrupt that, you. Go on, go on, please. It, it's just that the streaming services don't tell musicians how they calculate what they're going to pay them. They don't even tell them when they're going to pay them. It's a complete black box. Musicians are told they should simply be grateful that their music is now available worldwide that their music literally has no value anymore. Many musician friends of mine have received in emails from streaming service representatives telling them, you got to get over it. You're never going to make money anymore. So just give your music away for free and make money elsewhere. Sell t-shirts, you know, get on the road. You know, they're kind of like creating, they've created this psychological loop, this infusion of propaganda, you know, not unlike people that tell you that, um, Universal health care is a bad thing for a country. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's all the same sort of stuff here. So again, just to, to, you know, wrap it up, I'm not anti-streaming. I believe if they significantly raise the amount of money musicians get paid, no problem. But right now there's nothing forcing them to do that. And then they've also successfully brainwashed a lot of musicians into believing that this is the way and the only way. Well, young musicians, maybe, yeah. Um, you know, it's lots fun. of older ones too. Let me tell you, really, <laughs> lots of older. Ones. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. At least the um, template is in place where the people could get paid. It can be tracked. They can look and see x amount of people have have, have streamed your song. Whereas live music, um, is a very interesting thing. And I don't I don't know if you can speak to this at all. Uh, if you own a club or a public place where music is played, you have to pay ASCAP and or BMI a yearly fee. They don't want people doing cover tunes in your bar unless you're paying that fee. Now, the funny part is, even if the bar pays ASCAP and BMI and whoever it is the fee, if I go in there and do a cover song by Anya Garbarek, that would be amazing. <laughs> She's not going to get the money. If I do a song by Robert Johnson, if he's got any errors, that's not... They divide the money, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to spread false information. But they take those yearly fees from the clubs and divide it amongst a bunch of artists that are already on the books. If I go in and do a song by Bar Phillips from his album Three Day Moon, he's not going to get any money. Yeah, well, I this I mean, this is the construct of the music industry, right? Um, they make it as difficult as possible to extract income. Uh, <laughs> it, um, I mean, the theoretical construct of what you're describing means that musicians are supposed to get a percentage of that. But uh, you're right. I, I rarely hear of any musicians speaking of that as a relevant source of income. Yeah, yeah. Um... Now, let, let me ask you, um, if you don't mind, since I just read it yesterday, a little bit more about your interview with Anya Garbarek. Um, 
I know you addressed it toward the end of the article. And by the way, listeners, if you don't know what we're talking about, interviews, I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W-S. How much money do you have to pay to read these interviews? Nothing. They're there. They go back a long time. And if you're interested in the music I play here every Saturday and you don't know interviews, you've just been turned on to something that you're going to love. You're welcome. Um, now, you talked a little bit at the end about her bringing uh, her show outside of uh, Norway and, and the couple places she's played. Was there anything off the phone or an email that indicated, is there any chance this woman is ever going to come to the U.S.? It's something she wants to do. I'm sure she's investigating it. I mean, that is a extravagant show the road is just a service it's a multimedia spectacular so um there is going to have to be uh some serious um financing in order to bring that thing over here i would think it would have much more likelihood of happening elsewhere in europe than america sadly okay i'd like to um, um i don't think yeah. now one thing i have learned as an interviewer not to do anymore that I love to do, but I've learned it's just a dumb thing to do with musicians, is to ask them what they think of other musicians. <laughs> I, I love Union. I, I just love Union. And to hear somebody from an unlikely genre talk about somebody else from a, a genre you wouldn't think, that, that just excites the heck out of me. But I learned real quick, don't ask people what they think of somebody. It puts them on the spot, especially if they can't stand the person or they don't know who it is. But um, I'd like to throw out some names to you, I know you're also a musician, um, but since you do what you do for a living, I'm sure you don't mind being asked, and, and you don't mind saying, I, I'm not familiar with them, I don't like them, I think they should be banned from the face of the earth, they're my favorite person. Um, do you mind if I ask you about a couple people? Sure. Um, do you know and of, and what do you think of Aurora? Have you ever heard of her? I'm the, not the, familiar the, with them. I Oh, okay. I'm unfamiliar, I'm afraid. Unfamiliar. Okay. Um, check her out. I don't, I, I don't know what you think of her, and I don't know what she's considered. I don't know that she's considered a pop artist or not, but uh, she's fairly amazing, Anil. Um, check out a video on YouTube with her and a group called Heilung doing, uh, or no, no, uh, I'm sorry, not Heilung, uh, Wardruna. Wardruna. Very interesting stuff. I'd love to know what you thought of that. Um, are you familiar with Onya Sobel? spelled Agnes Obel. She's going to be opening for Dead Can Dance next year in the U.S. And, uh, boy, a lot of plugs for my girlfriend today. Uh, she turned me on to this woman. She's amazing. If you don't know Onya Sobel, she's really, really something. I, well, I've, I have tickets to see Dead Can Dance, and I did see the name as uh, someone essential to see opening for them. So I will be seeing her, but I have to admit to you, I'm, I'm not familiar with the music yet. Okay, yeah, see, this is why you don't ask people, <laughs> because it, I don't mean to embarrass you, but, uh, or anything like that. Uh, are you familiar with Nick Berch on ECM? Nick is a very good friend of mine, yes, and I've uh, visited him several times in uh, Zurich, and uh, I think there's a couple of interviews with him on interviews. Um, so, yeah, it's extraordinarily intimately familiar with Nick's work. Oh, wow, you have talked to him on interviews. Okay, I, I, I need to go back and look at your site, because when I wrote to you last week, I, I thought you had talked to somebody else, and I was wrong about that, too. Um, yeah, we had him in the studio for, like, two and a half hours. Lovely guy, very friendly, and just so deep into um, the, the concept that he's working with, with, with the funk. The, you know, the, the, I call him the funk monk. I've never called him that to his face, but... <laughs> um, just an, an amazing uh, approach, I think, to the minimalist groove thing. And um, is there anybody else out there doing stuff like that? Because that was fresh to me. Uh, that was pretty fresh to me. Well, there's a whole scene in Zurich. Okay. Um, and Nick is, Nick is certainly um, at the forefront of it. Is Christopher um, Inger part of that with his Cowboys from Hell? Because he sent me something. And I really like that stuff, too. Yeah, he's part of that, that Zurich scene for sure. Um, okay, okay. I think he's uh, more jazzy um, than the sort of minimalist groove scene, but he definitely has elements of that. Um, of course, there's a group called Sonar, led by Stefan Thelen, uh, a wonderful guitarist. Um, and they have a new album with David Tornout called Transportation. 
Oh, you know, I think that, yeah. Like a, yeah, they have a legacy of music as well. And, and Stefan was originally signed to Nick Birch's Ronin uh, rhythm label. Um, there's also the guy that could be considered the, the, the grandfather of the, you know, Swiss minimalist groove scene. Um, his name is Don Lee, uh, L I, um, there's an interview with him on interviews as well. And Nick started out playing in his band actually. Oh, I never um, heard of him. Okay. Nick, thanks. Yeah. Um, and his music's widely available digitally and through all the evil streaming services that we've been talking about. So you can go find it all. Um, there's in particular uh, something called Live Volume 2 that Nick plays on. And, you know, you'll hear Nick, you know, doing some crazy, like, early 70s Keith Jarrett level soloing, electric soloing on it. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, in fact, um, I think several of the guys that have gone through his group, Ronan, have come out of uh, the Don Lee uh, universe as well. Um, so there's a lot of intersection there. Um so I think between Sonar and, and Don Lee, um, those are probably two two of the people at the forefront, two of the you know uh, universes of music at the forefront. I would uh, recommend people checking out. Thanks, cool. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned streaming when we were talking about that earlier, not grabbing people's attention within the first few seconds. Uh, what a brave thing Manfred Eicher does. Is it Eicher or Eicher? Everybody tells me a different thing. What do you got? My understanding is it's Iker. <laughs> okay, that's what I keep getting. Okay, that's what I've been getting lately. Okay, Iker. I saw Bill Bruford say Eicher at the Park West. I saw Pat Metheny say, yeah, yeah, I just, okay, Iker. Today it's Iker. What a brave thing that Manfred does <laughs> the uh, beginning of his album, a, a good eight seconds of silence. I, I, I love that. I bet you a lot of people think there's something wrong with the stream and turn it off. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have no idea. Um, um, I'm not someone that's ever going to listen to an ECM album on streaming, so I um, I have no idea how that works or if they've yeah, they do they leave those those the, is the silence still there on the streaming versions? On the beginning uh, at the beginning of an album, now, he hasn't always adopted that, but um, yeah, yeah. If you put on the new uh, Julia Holzman or the new. Uh, you know, um, what, anything that's been done in the last year or two or three or four or five, yeah, there, there's some silence to begin. And, um, oh, good for him. Now, do you, would you like to talk a little bit about ECM at 50? I, I talked to uh, Mr. Kalman about ECM, and uh, I talked to him about um, Crimson. We're celebrating a lot of 50-year anniversaries these last couple of years, and we will be for a while, but ECM is very, very, very close to my heart. And, um, again... In the early days of internet, I couldn't find interviews with any of these artists except with you. So I know you're an ECM fan. Just uh, anything that comes to mind you'd like to say about this fantastic label and the ECM new series as well? Well, let me tell you something. It, ECM was the very first label to take interviews seriously. So that um, says something in and of itself. There's a wonderful woman there that were, named Tina Pelican who has worked in the marketing and publicity departments at ECM for a very long time. And when interviews was known by very few people, you know, in the early days of the Internet, uh, Tina was, you know, open to connecting me with people like Dave Holland and, you know, Ralph Towner. Um, I was just a kid. Um I would go as far as to say that interviews would not be what it is today without ECM, uh, the good folks at ECM taking an interest in what I do. So thank you to all of them, really. Um, I think ECM is one of the most important, not just labels, but communities of musicians in the entire history of space and time. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, um, countless hours of my life have been spent listening to this music. I'm sure I've gone to hundreds of ECM related concerts at this point in my life. Um, you know, uh, I think we all owe Manfred a great debt of gratitude for uh, what, what he's done and continues to do, even in this incredibly complex and challenging um, cycle of the music industry. More new music 
comes out on ECM than you can possibly imagine. I have to be honest with you, I don't know how he does it. Um, I don't even know how the funding works for it anymore, but I'm, I'm really glad it does. Well, it's funny you bring that up because it's a rude question to ask any of the musicians, so I don't. But I think about that all the time. Like, did Paul McCartney start that in 1969 and he doesn't want anybody to know? Uh, I don't know where he gets the funding to keep this stuff coming out. And you got to admit, a lot of it's still in print. Um, well, the um, virtually the entire catalog is in print. And what isn't in print, they've started releasing digitally only um he's got to re-release three day moon he has to re-release three day moon on physical format that is a space music classic that album is important i mean a lot of albums on ecm are important but three day moon really needs to be re-released i think yeah they're yeah ecm seems i mean they're doing a lot of 50th anniversary physical reissues they're also doing a a handful of digital only reissues like you know the first album by david torrens the everyman band um yeah yeah and jack dijonette's new rags are only available digitally which i think is a huge bummer but um you know i still you know dutifully get them digitally um but i would obviously love to be holding a physical cd of these things in my hands but you know i think ecm is also facing the reality um that they're just not going to sell many of these things uh, in physical form, and it is what it is, I guess. Well, they've got my show every Saturday that I maybe now and then a week goes by where I don't play something on ECM, but, I mean, there's 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 a lot of people that are getting turned on on Saturday afternoons, I hope. Have you ever met Manfred? I have not, no. Okay. I, um... I was going to ask you, and you can't answer this because you've never met him, but I, I, I often wonder if he's an extremely lonely person. I mean, n- you know what I mean? He, he travels so much, and this is all kind of on his shoulders. And I just wonder if it's a lonely existence. Um, I hope it's fulfilling enough for him to not feel terribly isolated, you know? Um, He's doing that pretty much on his own. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I've only read and you know seen films about him, but I think as an abstract generalization, the people that tend to be in a position like that can't get too personally or emotionally involved in the lives of all the people they interact with, or they could never function. They could, he could never produce that many albums and be dragged into the personal lives and stories of all the people he touches. So um, I hope he has a way of, uh, of dealing with that. And clearly he does because he's still going um, after all this time. Do you think uh, this is just speculation on my part and your part, but, um, and I don't mean to be morbid, but I, I can't help wondering what happens to ECM records when Manfred leaves the planet. Um, I've discussed this with a couple of people. Some people seem to think uh, it ends with him. Uh, I've had a pet theory that I'm starting to revise, actually, that he has a lot of the stuff in the can, and that his, um, I don't know what the word would be, but his way of doing things would would continue, because the albums are already actually produced and in the can. Um, have you ever thought about what might happen with ECM after Manfred? I know it's a morbid subject, but it's such an important label. You know, this, um, I have a lot of musician friends who ponder and theorize about this as well actually to be honest um i can't i i can't imagine an ecm without manfred that makes absolutely no sense to me um i agree i think the only way it could continue is if he's got stuff in the can and that might you know maybe there's archives maybe there's plans for that um as I said, I mean, who am I to say? I mean, there's other people involved that maybe could pick up the baton. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it would be okay though for ECM to to wrap up. We we've been talking about a lot of the the evils of the internet and you know the issues of streaming and all of that. And I think we're at a point now. Um, it was uh, one of my recent interviews. It's not out yet. It's with a phenomenally great group called Kneebody. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I am not. Um, genre-bending, jazz-ish 
act um, uh, with one of the greatest drummers of our time named Nate Wood. Uh, I, I highly recommend you look into them. There'll be a giant piece on them in interviews coming up soon. Um, but uh, where was I going with this? Um, you know, the, 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 the point uh, during the interview I did with them, uh, you know, they said, you know, the, the thing is about artistic survival and, you know, um, the possibilities of music in this day and age are that, you know, really we're down to, because there's so little money to be made, you either do what you want to do or don't do it at all. You might as well go be a Starbucks barista. You might as well go work at a checkout line because you're going to make more money than you are as a musician. So you might as well just make the most amazing music you can make. And that's anybody's perspective. It's not everyone's perspective. You have this whole nasty sort of streaming lead pop constructions I was talking about. But then you also have the fact that the floodgates are open right now. I think the world of band camp specifically is one of those places. Um, the anti-streaming streaming company where the real musicians go to really propagate what they do. Um, so I think there's a lot of fantastic music coming out now in an incredibly niche way. I have a good friend named Marcus Reiter, who you're probably familiar with. Yes. Um, uh, who puts out all kinds of amazing projects on Bandcamp. Um, I doubt he's making a lot of money on any of them, but uh, he puts them out in, in pretty significant quantity. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't want to speak for him, but my theory is that maybe fewer people buying uh, more albums might be the model that is working for him that a lot of people are, are, are moving towards in the creative realm. You know, all of this to say, I don't think all is lost. I think um, there's still a lot of great music being made today. Um, you know, and you can oh, use I do the too. technology. I do too. You can make, make the distribution technology work for you in a way that you know keeps your soul intact. Um, not a lot of people are willing to do that, though. But um, well, and to, there's and, that possibility. And, and to forgive people like yes, who were brought up in an age of, you know, the record industry owned by all kinds of people <laughs> uh you know it, once it becomes about money it kind of has to stay a, about money that that i do know once it becomes a, a successful enterprise uh you have to keep it as such because to to stop thinking about the bottom line is going to upend the whole thing so i i do understand that well the types of the types of bands you're talking about are become more than bands they become corporate enterprises they have infrastructures they have you know dozens of people on payroll <laughs> you know you're right they they literally you know after you know when john entwistle died the who had a tour uh you know that was about to start and um you know pete townsend got on stage you know that that first show and said hey we have to do this we have a lot of people depending on us um yeah, i think they even mentioned you know the insurance company and stuff like that um like all of these giant corporate factors, you know, that um, come into play, you know, when, when, a, when groups at that level, you know, have to kind of lumber on even if they don't want to. Um, having said that, The Who have just made a, a fairly decent new album, actually. But um, Yeah, I haven't heard it. Uh, yeah, you should. You, you might be surprised. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, Neil. Um, let's, let's end with... What's going on now? What is the role of the music musician in the 21st century uh, going forward? Um, the role of music right now? Um, that is a big question. Um, you have two minutes. I, <laughs> no, I'm I kidding. Think the role of, of music um, is really down to the individual's perception of what that role is now. Um, well, as far as like music, music, can can music change the world? Something Fripp has been pondering lately, something I pondered my whole life. We know it did change the world back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, that's kind of what I mean. The role of music in today's world, and how does a musician negotiate that? I have to be honest with you. I don't think music can change the world today the way it used to. Uh, Steve Van Zandt's Sun City just came out as a, a glorious deluxe edition yesterday, I believe. One of the greatest protest records of all time that played an actual role 
enforcing the dismantling of apartheid. Um, maybe the most recent example of, of, of protest music changing the world um, post Live Aid. Um, I don't know if it's possible anymore. I don't know if, I mean, the, the, the fire hose of, of content that comes out these days. I mean, you mentioned it yourself, kids, not just kids, everyone across all age groups have so many options and are wasting so much of their lives on social media that um, to have the sort of nucleus of a really important social political idea take root from a piece of music or as they call it, you know, content, it's fairly difficult to conceive of. Um, so, uh, you know, it actually comes back to what I started the answer with. It's really about the individual these days um, and, and hoping you can reach those individuals and elevate the conscious of an in, consciousness of an individual. Um, at the micro level, more than the macro level, I don't know if you can achieve the mass of influence that you used to anymore. Um, well, you can't. As far as the role of the music. Pardon? Well, you can't because you you know there only used to be a few stations. So when you reach people, you know it's more broken up now. But you know we can change the world without. I mean, and I know you know this, but um, the positive. It doesn't have to just be protest music. I mean, I think part of the reason that the world has gotten a little more dour, and I think people feel they've lost. We've lost our innocence. You can't sing happy songs anymore. You can't. I mean. The thing about the 60s is people knew how to protest, they knew how to call out, you know, bull crap, and they knew how to party and have a good time at the same time. There was a, 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 a nearing sense of enjoying life. And I think positive music uh, changes the world as much or more. So I, I, I still believe music can change the world. I just don't think anybody believes it can. I would like to believe that's true, um, and um, I, I hope you know. I, you know, in terms of a musician's role in the world these days, I, I think the, the the people like the Nick Birches of the world that are creating music designed to connect, you know, directly at the subconscious level with listeners and sort of take you out of the morass of the sort of day to day sphere of junk news content and manipulation that we live in. Is critically important. I think um, music as meditation, music designed to um, free ourselves of, of, of all this this gunk. I think I think is critical. Absolutely. I, I think I think maybe that is the one of the uh, you know the the great things musicians can still achieve with what they do is the knowledge that um, they're providing something that is kind of emancipatory and takes you out of, you know, your own world and then kind of enables you to contemplate a bigger picture. So I think that would be my, my closing thoughts on that. Beautifully put to emancipate you and give you a bigger picture. I love that. Thank you, Anil. Um, Matt, I'd love to have you on again sometime. This is fun. It went by real quick and I, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it was at least a semi successful interview. I appreciate your time. I had a good time and would be happy to do it again. Excellent, man. All right. Well, listen, I know you have a little bit of a cold, so I doubly thank you for calling in today. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, and um, I will definitely check out the artists you mentioned that I am not familiar with. So um, thank you so much for calling in, man. Have a, have a great weekend, and please continue doing what you're doing. I will be doing that. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, man. Bye-bye.